Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, thank you very much. It's uh, Thanks for organizing the conference. And uh, it's, as usual, a great pleasure to be uh, here in Natal. I already learned a lot from uh, Itamar's talk, and maybe even more. At today's lunch, I had an amazing lunch, and it was really awesome to be sitting close to Giuseppe and Karen and Michael, and uh, it was uh, really amazing. I learned a lot about lots of things that I have no idea about. And uh, I hope I'll tell you a little bit about something that you might also find enjoyable. So let me start with something basic, and I will use orange for the real world and the white for uh, super young meals. So let me start with something basic about the real world, which is, of course, that we have three colors. So we have, say, quarks, Q, and we can have a quark field. And the quarks would have some index i, which would run from 1 to n. So of course, in the real world, we have three quarks, or two families of three quarks. And then we have gluons, a mu. And we have eight gluons, where we have this gluon field, like a photon, except that, of course, very importantly, it's a nonabelian field. It's itself a matrix, i and j, where each of these indices takes n values. And this young mills theory, of course, describes the strong force. And we'll say a few more things about it. And today, however, I'll be discussing a cousin of young mills theory, which is a super, called super young mills theory, which is a theory where we have n as well. It doesn't need to be integer. It doesn't need to be 3, but it's an integer. And it also has gluons. We also have gluons, a mu, i, j. But on top of gluons, we also have matter, like the quarks of the real world, except that this matter is a bit different. We have a bunch of scalars, z, x, y. We have some fermions. We could call them phi 1 alpha, blah, 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 blah. There are a bunch of fields. But what differs this is that these guys, they are all matrices. So they are not like a quark with three values, but this is a theory where both the carrier, the gluon, and the fields, they are matrices. Otherwise, it's a similar theory to young mills except that it's much more symmetric. Now, like young mills this theory has a coupling, g young mills and this theory also has a coupling, g young mills But of course, very importantly, the beta function of young mills is not zero, meaning there is a scale, and the theory is asymptotically free in the UV, and you have glue balls in, uh, if you flow to the IR and the mesons and the ions and so on. Whereas young mills, this G is a coupling, so it doesn't flow. There is no dimension in this theory, and this theory is what's called a conformal theory. So this theory has absolutely no scale. The coupling is not something like in young mills that depends at what energy you are. If you go to very high energy, it's effectively three. If you go to low energy, the theory is strongly coupled. Here, G is a coupling. It's a parameter, and you choose whatever it is. You can choose it to be weak coupling or to be strong coupling. And then there's also N. So we have G young mills, and we have N in this, in this theory. And one of the remarkable th facts of this theory, that I'm not going to explain why it is true, but I'm going to tell you that this is true, is that super young mill, maximally supersymmetric young mills theory, is also a string theory. So there is a duality that tells you that if you learn how to study this non-abelian gauge theory, and if you could solve completely this non-abelian gauge theory, you would also be learning about a putative theory of quantum gravity. You would also be solving a particular string theory. Now, why would it have anything to do with string theory? Hopefully, as I go along, you will see that there are some objects that will look like a string, and they don't just look like a string. The claim is that they are a string. And we will see that at some point, things like strings will show up. And then, uh, if it's true that this is a string theory, these parameters, g and mills and n, should be related to something in string theory. So what is string theory? String theory is a theory of strings. 
And what can a string do? A string can move in space time, and maybe it can vibrate a lot or not. It could move almost directly, or it could move with vibrations. And so there's something called the tension of the string that tells you if the string vibrates or not. And furthermore, the string can split into two or not. So there's also a coupling of the string. So if you want, there are two couplings in string theory. The tension, that tells you how quantum it is with respect to vibrations of the string, and the coupling, that tells you what's the probability of strings to merge and to split and so on. And n, 1 over n, is related to the string coupling. Namely, when n is infinity, the theory simplifies. And this was a limit that Tooft understood very well. And in this limit, strings do not split. But it doesn't mean they are boring. They still very much vibrate quantum mechanically. It's still very rich. And this G and Mills would be related to the string tension. In a way that large G and Mills, large coupling, would be related to strong string tension, meaning the string is classical. It just follows the minimal vibration mode possible. And when the coupling is smaller, the tension would be smaller, and the string would vibrate as it propagates in space-time. OK? So what would be the hardest regime from string theory? It would be small g and mills and small n, because the string would be vibrating a lot and splitting a lot and so on. Okay, it's a very simple question. I should, it's, there's probably a very simple answer to it, but uh, uh, let me come back to it uh, later. In any case, what is the mathematical theory? It's a mathematical theory of surfaces. So you just associate to each string configuration a number that's the action, right? And that action comes with a number behind, and that number behind is the string tension. If the number is big, the action wants to be minimal, and the surface will fluctuate the list. The other number is a number that when you have a sum over two-dimensional surfaces, you can weight them by their genus. You can say genus one surface come with one weight. Genus two come with another weight. And this would weight whether strings split or not. In that two-dimensional action, you could think that you had an extra topological term that just measures the local curvature of that surface, and that tells you what the genus is. And that could come with a different coefficient. And then you would have the two parameters, the fluctuations and the genus of the surface. One is the area of the surface, one is the topology of the surface. And a priori, you, could, you would have a theory. Good. So now, as a spoiler for what we are going to do, let me put here a small spoiler box. And you will see that we will take n to be, say, 2.3. Like the number of colors doesn't need to be an integer, we will claim. And a priori, if we think carefully, we could continue it and take it whatever we want. And it will be clear why would we want to do it. Now, as I said, super young meal is conformal. Right? So it means there's no scale. Right? So if you zoom in, zoom out, the theory is the same. It's like at a phase transition. There's no particular scale. And therefore, your theory will have operators. Oh, there are many of them. Let me use the label A to indicate all of them at some position x, another one, let me call it b, at some position y, 
right? So be like the analog of these displacement operators at some point and at another point. And what could the result be? Well, there is no scale, so the only thing it can be is a power law. So we can always normalize these operators such that, depending on the separation between the points, there will be some power law with some coefficient that is called the dimension of the operator. Which is always equal to some classical dimension plus some quantum dimension that we often use the letter gamma. Okay, now what are these? Uh, what are these? What's the meaning of these dimensions? These dimensions are also equal, if you want, to the energies, the possible energies of the theory, in the following sense: that if you imagine you take your field theory and put it on some sphere, then you have a system on a finite volume. It has some spectrum. And the spectrum are these dimensions. So that's one meaning. It's really literally the energies of the theory as I put it on a sphere. Another important meaning, according to this duality to string theory, these are also the energies of the string theory objects. I did not call them strings because in string theory you don't have only strings. You can have strings. You can have more complicated objects that I'm not going to discuss today, like D brains, which are extended objects where strings end. You could have black holes or geometries that are deformed by many strings and so on. And each of them would correspond to a different operator. Each operator is a state in your theory. So you could describe, some operators could describe one string, some could describe three strings, some could describe a black hole, some could describe a D brain. It depends on what operator you consider. Now, the way it works is the following, to distinguish this, is that you will have strings or small point-like objects when the dimensions are small, when they are order one. And you will have objects that are so heavy that they are not probes anymore, but they deform the geometry. They could create a black hole or any other geometry. When the dimension is very big, and in particular is of order n square with n very large, where n is the number of colors. So this is also something standard, right, in quantum field theory. When you consider probes, operator at a given point, when you consider operators at given points, they could be something small, like a trace of f square, some very small probe, that doesn't, that's like measuring a system, putting three thermometers to measure the correlations without trying to deform the system. Or they could be some trace of F squared to the power one million that is like hitting the system, like uh, what <laughs> Itamar was doing, <laughs> creating some big displacement there. And there it really deforms the vacuum, it changes the state. Similarly here, what we mean by heavy is you have this theory where you are dealing with this gauge theory with N squared degrees of freedom. These fields are matrices. So what does it mean to be light or heavy? It's compared to that n square. If you have an operator that has energy 100, that is small if n is 1 million. But if n is 3, that's big. So depending on what is the number of degrees of freedom that you have in your system at each point, the number of colors, what you call a probe or an operator that is strong enough to change the state depends uh, on, on n. And so to be explicit, maybe can we take off the projector and can I move this up and then I'll go back to it. Sorry? Yeah. Four. Yeah, these uh, operators, these are big dimensions. In a CFT, right? You can have operators. That, yeah, they would all be, uh, they, it's a conformal theory. So they are all power law, and these would have big dimensions, big energies, yeah. Irrelevant, yeah. yeah. So let's, let me be explicit and consider 
an example of an operator okay of a, an operator that would make sense to insert at a given at a given point of space time so one example that i said we have all the fields of the theory and of course, if you give me fields, and if there are some scalars, I'll use the scalars. I'm not a masochist. I don't want to deal with any indices or anything. So you could say, let's use the, let's consider an operator Z. Now, this is not good. It's not good because we are dealing with a gauge theory. This object is not gauge invariant. Z itself transforms. I have a field of my theory. This would transform by conjugation by the gauge transformation matrix. So one thing I could do is, for example, multiply, say, I don't know, a bunch of Zs and then a bunch of x's, and then take the trace where all these fields are inserted at the same position in four dimensions. This would be a gauge invariant operator. I took six scalars, so this would have dimension six. So is dimension six very big or very small? Well, it depends. If n is very big, it will be small. If n is very small, it will be big. Right? I could make it longer. Now, there are other operators with dimension six. There are, for example, trace of zx, zx, zx. This is another operator of dimension six. And I could have linear combinations like this. And this operator, these precise linear combinations, what defines them is that what these operators need to be, they need to be the eigenvectors of the operator that implements dilatation in the theory, which is of the dilatation operator of the CFT, which is an operator that you can compute in the quantum field theory. Okay, so there is an operator that implements dilatation, and whether it tells me, should I use this operator or this or a combination of both, it's an outcome of finding what are the operator which has the right anomalous dimension. Now, let me just make a comment that this is, again, in the real world, we would also write gauge invariant operators like mesons, for example, like some QQ bar operator. This would be, again, gauge invariant because Q transforms the gauge transformation, Q bar kills the gauge transformation. Right? But there they are vectors, so it's enough to multiply. And I could consider things that look more like this if I do say Q, and then I could put a bunch of fields, oops, a bunch of field strengths in the middle, or a Wilson line in the and then another Q. And this would look like a, a, an open string where I have a quark, an anti-quark, and some kind of flux tube between the two. Here, instead, it's more like a closed string. You see a trace, it's a cyclic object. And you read it like a string. It's a string where I have three z's and then three x's. And indeed, this object, you also, it also looks not only like a string, this looks like a linear combination of two possible string states. And that's exactly what this duality with string theory proposes. That you should think of this object in the gauge theory literally as a string and there another string. Now, if you want, you can also think of it in different ways. For example, you can think of this as a quantum spin chain, where this z, you can think of it as a spin up, and this x as a spin down. And then you are saying, my state is a spin chain quantum state, which is a linear combination of up, 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 down, 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 plus up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's a particular entangled state. And which quantum state should you use? Again, the one which has definite dimensions, which are eigenvectors of the dilatation operator of the CFT. OK? It would be the energy of the string. It would be the operator that would measure the energy of the string. So you would have a string moving, and you would say, what's the energy of this string? And the quantization of that energy of the string would give a quantum Hamiltonian that would give the evolution of the string. <clears throat> and, so, and so in N equals 4 super young meals, we are dealing with these quantum spin chains or quantum strings in these super young meals, and we want to study the energies of these strings or of these uh, states. And then uh, we could take these states, and we could ask if we have this state OA, as we change n, the number of colors, so let's take OA to be some state with some delta much bigger than 1. This one has delta equal to 6 at the classical level, but suppose we take a very big field. 
Then what's the claim? Suppose I take a state which has dimension delta equal 100. Okay? Then uh, if n is infinity, 100 is nothing. 100 is a small number compared to infinity. So here, when n goes to infinity, we are dealing, this state will be some gas of strings with a fixed number of strings. So it's a state that could have one string or two strings or three strings, but it has a fixed number. Because remember that the probability of splitting is zero. So if you, if you have three strings, you have three strings, and that's it. They, they don't mix with other things. Then if you start decreasing n, it's like in the lab if you had a spin chain that could mix with two spin chains. It's like a second quantized spin chain, where now your system, you could have one spin chain or two spin chains, and they can be in superposition with each other. And you start having multiple spin chains, multiple strings at the same time. And eventually, you reach a point where n is of order of square root of delta. In other words, delta scales like n squared, where now, Compared to that n, my operator is very heavy and can produce a black hole. So you start with a gas of strings, and then your operator at this region would be some kind of black hole or maybe some deformed geometry. Because at this point, compared to n, n could be still very big, but now at this point, the operator is big enough that it's really changing the geometry. It's really having an effect of back reacting on your vacuum. And then you could decrease n even more. But if you decrease n even more, now the quantum effects are so big that you have something a bit murkier to describe. You could call it a quantum black hole, because no one knows what a quantum black hole is, so you can never be wrong. But it would be, it's OK. It's something very quantum in quantum gravity, which would have lots of black holes. But the punchline is that it would be cool if we could continuously deform n. n is a number. It's a number of colors, again. In the real world, it's three. In n equals 4, it's whatever we want. It could be 7. But if we could tune it, we could start at n equal infinity, where we have a bunch of decoupled spin chains, each of which we know very well how to study. People know very well how to study one-dimensional spin chains. In particular, these ones turn out to be integrable, so you can even solve them exactly. And then you could tune n and start going into a domain where you could have geometries and black holes and so on, and you could st study it continuously and follow and ask what happens to a black hole how does a black hole become st a string? That's exactly what's called a string black hole transition. You start with some strings, and then you increase the coupling, and the self-gravitation of this object poof, forms a black hole. So that would be the motivation for trying to think of non-abelian gauge theories with a continuous number of colors. It should allow us to follow continuously very different regimes. Regimes where you have free strings to regimes where you have geometries and black holes where the gravitational force is very strong. We don't know. But <laughs> the problem now is translated into something very concrete, which is study dimensions of operators in conformal field theories. It's not something very fancy about uh, what is quantum gravity and uh, firewalls and whatever. It is just take a CFT, compute its dimensions, and follow them. Study the dimensions as you change n and see what happens. Right? So. Now we can answer these type of questions. OK. So yeah. So here in the blackboard, I, uh, I hid uh, an example. So first of all, let me know how am I doing with time? I should be probably around half an hour now. Is it true? Yeah? OK, very good. So. Uh, so now, we uh, <clears throat> here, I considered an example of this dilatation operator. I said, let's consider some operators and write down this dilatation operator. And I wrote it here in advance because the formula is a bit intimidating, and now I will let us digest it together. OK, so first, it's not such a huge matrix. It's a 6 by 6 matrix. And it has many zeros. You see, the, the, the remaining, the last three rows are zeros. So it's, you should really not be scared. The entries are also very simple. And you see that the entries are either 
numbers of order one, like in this block, or in this block here, or in this block here, or one over n numbers in the off-diagonal stuff. Okay, so first there is this, and as a function of n, it's very simple. The entries are either order one or one over n, right? So very simple n dependence. Now, what are the columns and rows? So this is an Hamiltonian whose eigenvalues give me the operators with good dimension. Namely, if I have some basis of local operators, wi, I apply a dilatation and I will give a matrix H with elements i, j times the basis wj. So this is an operator that acts on these operators, giving me some matrix ij times the elements of the basis. Now, this operator itself, Bizert, who is a physicist in doing n equals 4 superior mills, computed this matrix. And the final result is something that will be written in terms of objects like this. If you have elements, let me use w for the possible fields of my theory. If you have some elements w, it will be something like this. There will be some wij, the matrix elements, some variational with respect to some elements kl, and there will be some commutator of this object, square with some number, c, i, j, k, l. It will be something like this. And you see that this object only makes sense when you are dealing with matrices, which are objects with indices. So you, you act with this on some gauge invariant operator, and you get another gauge invariant operator. But by definition, the way I wrote it, it makes sense when I have a matrix with index i and k and l. It doesn't make sense when I'm saying n is 2.3 and we are dealing with matrices of dimension 2.3. Now, when you act, however, on a basis element, you get a new basis element, right? And so you could take an example where for some quantum numbers, these are the basis elements, W1 up to W6. So there is a choice of quantum numbers. For example, you can see that all these fields have three scalar Z and three scalars X that I chose. So that's because number of Z and number of X is a quantum number. Why it's this precise combination? It's because uh, you can ask me if you really care, but it's some highest weight condition. It's not important. So with some quantum numbers, the basis elements, there are six. So I fix the quantum numbers, there are six elements. Then I act with my Hamiltonian on each basis element, and it only makes sense because they are matrices. But once I act on W1, I get a combination of W1 and W6. And now I code it into this matrix, funny H. And funny H now makes sense for any N. And now I could ask, what are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix funny H as I change n? So now this object here, here on the right hand side, here n clearly needs to be an integer. But as I'm here, n, I can now take it to be any real number. No problem with that. And now see what happens. So this state here, W1, you see, I can write. You see that these states are quite different. W1 is like a single string state because you see it's just a trace, one trace. W2 is also a single string state, a combination of single string states because it's also one single trace, a linear combination of trace plus trace plus trace. W3, however, is a double trace. It's a combination of two spin chains. It's like you have a quantum state of two spin chains or two strings. And so is W4, and so is W5, and W6 is what's called a triple trace, is a product of three strings. And what does the Hamiltonian do? The Hamiltonian, it can act on the spin chain, moving things. So the Hamiltonian can act on a single string state, giving single string state plus, with some probability, one over n, it can split the string into two. And that's what we see there, that the off-diagonal elements are one over n compared to the block. And the Hamiltonian, acting on a multiple string state, for example, a two string state, can act on each of them, and then it gives a double string. Or it can join the two, and there will be some suppressed coefficient of joining. Or it could a priori also split one of them into two smaller ones and give a triple string straight. But now, but it doesn't look at emission. 
but it should be emission. These are energies. Energies should be emission. Okay? But it's not emission. So, okay, so let's put a puzzle here or a question that is age is not emission. Asks Karen very well, and it looks totally crazy because H should be an energy. So let me postpone this question a little bit and let's see another puzzle. And this question, I will solve it in a second. Now, this is just finite dimensional because I chose the quantum numbers. For example, I said I have three Zs and three Xs. So then the dimension is at most two to the six because I can, I can only have Z, Z, X, X, X. So there are some quantum numbers that I chose. So I'm studying this problem in a fixed subsector of quantum numbers. Right? It's like saying I have at most five spins, then the Hilbert space is finite, right? Now we can compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. We can compute the condition, I, com I compute the eigenvalues of this matrix, and I get this condition here. Now, here is the energy, gamma cube equals zero. Okay, that's obvious because this matrix had lots of zeros in the bottom part. So of course, there are three eigenvalues that are zero. And then uh, there is a cubic equation that tells me that my gamma lives in some Riemann surface. And there are th three solutions to this equation. So let's plot these energies. So let's plot gamma as we change n. And let zero be here so that we can plot this nice line. So first, there are zero. Zero is one of the solutions. OK, so that one is obvious. OK. <clears throat> then uh, there are the other ones. And if you solve them, one does something like this. And the other two do something like this. They annihilate. And then later, they create here and do this. Okay. And this is, of course, again, very strange. This should be emission. So how could the energies annihilate and become complex at some point? Moreover, if you know a little bit about supersymmetry, you know the energies should not be negative. They should be positive. How are they becoming negative? But forget about negative. It's an emission. It's an energy. It cannot become complex. So here they are annihilating. They would become complex. And then here they would re-emerge. And so a related question is H is not emission, and gamma could not be complex. OK, so what's happening? is that by continuing in n, we have to be careful that some states could decouple along the way. And so the correct way to understand this is to think H should be emission with respect to what scalar product. And in fact, this was something that it was, and it was con people were confused at some point. And I think the paper that best explained this was a paper that Actually, David wrote with uh, Radu Royvan and uh, Andrei Mikhaev. And uh, so the point is that there is a nice object you should consider, which is what's the norm of these states. So let's define an, a new matrix W, Ij, which we define as saying, I put one of the basis elements, say, at some position 1, and the other basis element at some position, say, 0. And this is just, and by this expectation, I just mean do weak contractions between the two. Just contract, draw propagators between the two. And you construct this matrix, and it's a six by six matrix. It's much denser than that one I'm not going to write. I'm just going to write the first term. is four n to the six minus two n to the four plus tac, tac, tac. But the point is that it's a six by six polynomial in n matrix. Now, this contraction, again, it's something that the way you contract only makes sense when n is an integer. You are contracting this operator. So if you use a famous notation that physicists use for these operators as double lines, because each field has two, two indices, when you contract one operator with another one here, you draw diagrams. This would be a diagram. And then uh, whenever you have a color loop, you assign a factor of n. And so you start with a matrix that only makes sense when you are dealing with matrices and you contract the matrix with double line. But after you draw the diagram, it's just a statistical mechanical diagram. Now n is just a weight that you give. And if you have six loops, you get n to the six. So now in this matrix, we start here with n being an integer. And now here, 
and can take any real number. And the statement of hermeticity is basically that this matrix H should be Hermitian like this, something like this. And this is indeed true. So it's admission with respect to the scalar product induced by the field theory. But now we could do something nice. We could take these states here <laughs> that diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and we could check what's their norm. And what we would see is that the norm of this state is always positive. But we would see that the norm of this state is positive up to here. But the norm of this state, for example, stops here. Meaning that at this point, this state starts to get zero norm and decouples from the theory. The norm with this scalar product, right? And what is happening? What's happening is that when n decreases, all these gauge invariant operators are no longer independent. For example, if you are dealing with SU2 matrices, trace of z to the 4 is just trace of z square square. So they are so-called trace relations that tell you that the Hilbert space, as you change n, at fixed n, the Hilbert space could become smaller and smaller. And so what happens is that this state goes all the way in n, all the way to n equals 2, say, if you want. But this state stops here, and this state, even before you reach some critical n, it disappears. And similarly, you could compute the energy of these states, and you could say that there are three of them, and one of them has positive norm up to two, one of them has positive norm up to three, and one of them has positive norm up to four. And so you start with three states of zero energy, then you have two, and then you have one. And what are these states of zero energy? What states should have like three strings or two strings, in this case, three strings and two strings, and not be protected? They are gravitons. Gravitons are states whose energy should, they should continue to be massless. They should not be deformed. And so these states here, they are multi-gravitons. Multi because there are two or three of them. And so we have these graviton states. Some of them continue forever. Some of them eventually decouple from the spectrum. And that's the structure of the Hilbert space. And so this is what uh, we learned. And now uh, about following things in n. So again, let me make a summary. So by, uh, let me make one more comment that when you take n to infinity, you could ask, what are these eigenvectors? And you would see that, indeed, this one is a single string, this one is a single string, and this one is a double string. And here, two of these are double strings, and one of them is a triple string. Forget about the gravitons, because they decouple. They form a life on their own, right? Gamma is equal to 0. It's not the most interesting function. But this is interesting, because you see, at large n, they decouple, right? It's like you either have one spin chain or you have two spin chains. And when you have two spin chains, they are decoupled. They don't talk to each other. But what's fun is that when you analytically continue in n, they are the same function. It is just you start with a single string. And if you could, like a magician, control the gravitational constant, and you would go do a path in the complex plane, you would come back and you would have two strings. Uh, I, I, I think that's cute, and that's amusing. And that allows us to see that, indeed, here we start with some quantum strings, and then you go down, and here some crazy stuff happened. Now, this was just an example, but now I would like to show you in the last 10 minutes, do I have 10 minutes? Some slides that, as an application of these ideas to a slightly more complicated case, that does make contact with some black hole explorations that people have been making. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can. It is just that the total Hilbert space here is six. I have at most six fields by quantum numbers. And uh, when you have at most six fields, you can have at most three strings. If you had eight fields, you would have four strings. So the bigger the field is, the more it can fragment into. Yeah. 
Yes. So let me make two comments about quantum mechanics and this quantum spin chains. One is that when we are at large n, like I said, we deal with one spin chain because they decouple, so you can think it's only one spin chain. On that spin chain, you have an Hamiltonian, and that's a quantum spin chain. And so it's a one-dimensional quantum spin chain with all the entanglement, blah, blah, that one-dimensional quantum spin chain has. So with all the properties of entanglement of that spin chain, it will have. Then when we decrease n, we now start having entanglement, not only inside the spin chain, but between spin chains. And now we could have two spin chains being entangled with each other and so on. In this simple example, it doesn't happen because it's too simple and we get basically product states of spin chains. But in the example that I'm going to show now, that happens. And whether that's significant or not, I don't know, but I would love to hear more. And I'll show you some formulas with an operator that I don't know if it exists or not, but we call it entanglement operator because it reminds a lot of entanglement, but I would love to know if you have seen this somewhere. Okay. So, so this is what I told you in the blackboard so far. I use slightly different notation. Instead of x and z, I call one of the scalars phi 1, 2, and phi 2, 3. It's just a conventional notation in n equals 4. But then, as I said, you have some energies. But if you check the norm, there's no puzzle. The energies never become complex or negative. Before they do, they would, the norm would become zero. And so physically, everything is OK. And you get this picture that I described. Now, next, we consider this operator, which is made out of more fields, not much more. Instead of six, it's seven fields. And I wrote, it's a combination of dot, dot, dot with many states. And it has a bunch of scalars and a bunch of fermions. So there are now, instead of six, there will be 8,000 states by 8,000. If you restrict a bit the quantum numbers, you can go to 70 times 70. And you have to diagonalize some 70 by 70 matrix whose result is, is drawn here. And there are lots of cool things happening here, like levels repelling, things annihilating, and so on. That's going on. But in particular, there is a funny thing going on. There is one state lower here that goes, 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 and then it has zero energy. And when you have zero energy, remember, gravitons had zero energy because there was a reason. They could not change their energy. They were massless particles. They were just zero. If you want, if you want they are also supersymmetric in this theory. They are part of a, some supersymmetric multiple. What's happening is that you start with some state, and then suddenly the energy of it becomes zero. And when the energy of something is zero in a supersymmetric field theory, it's because typically the state became BPS, it became protected. So what happened is that you had a state, and then the state, when you change n, at n equal 2, the state gets some emergent supersymmetry. And indeed, this state becomes 1 over 16 BPS. It's a state that has a very small amount of supersymmetry, but some supersymmetry enough to protect the state. And these states, which have the minimum amount of supersymmetry, they are interesting because they should describe the simplest possible black holes in this theory. So if you ask, are there solutions of GR that describe black holes but still have some supersymmetry? And the answer is, you need 1 over 16. With more supersymmetry, you don't have. And so this is the first time this happens. So if you want this state that at this point turns out to take this form, this is the simplest wave function of the smallest possible black hole. <laughs> this will be, it's a very small black hole. It's a black molecule. It has seven atoms. And this would be the simplest possible black hole. This, is, this would be a very quantum 1 over 16th BPS black hole that happens at n equals to 2. Now, this is just based on the observation that the energy goes to zero. And we could try to explain what's happening from the point of view of group theory, what's going on, how could it become BPS. But that's a very advanced thing. I'll postpone it. But what's interesting is that people knew that such state existed. Because there are techniques for counting states and for counting BPS states. So they knew it existed. No one had seen what the state looked like. And here is what the state looked like. So if you want to look at the wave function of a black hole, it's here. But now what's fun, you can take that black hole state or that very quantum black hole state and follow it to a regime where things are under much more control. Follow it to large n. And what does it become? It becomes a triple string state. So the black hole becomes a state which is a Konishi state entangled with two gravitons. And so let me write down what I mean by this. By this, I mean that the operator takes the following form. Let's think first of the, an, an EPR pair. What's an EPR pair? It's spin up, down, plus down, up. And I could write this state as saying that it's up 
down with an operator, I call this entanglement operator. I don't know if it's a conventional name that does the following. It does nothing, or it changes the one on the right by sigma plus by changing the one on the minus by the converse. And this operation of one plus acting on the right and acting with a conjugate on the left entangles the two spins. Ah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Adamar? Okay. So then I will say this should be the supersymmetric Adamar operator. I take this state that turns out to be the lightest non zero state that there is, that's called the Konishi state. It's dual to the lightest possible non zero string, the lightest massive string state. And two states that have zero energy, like the ones we saw before, two gravitons, two because there is a square here. And then I have this operator that acts with the supersymmetry on the right and the conjugate on the left, and the rotation on the right and conjugate rotation on the left, with all the possible symmetries with precise coefficients. So it, it, it's, it's not only two terms, it's a many terms because n equals four has many symmetries, but it does exactly this. It tries to entangle as much as possible Konishi with the two gravitons. So the claim is you take Konishi, you entangle it a lot with two gravitons, and then if you increase the gravitational constant, it forms a black hole. Okay, these are just... Okay. No, the argument is just, if you want, it's... So, uh, people were studying uh, 1 over 16 states, and they understood that there are many of them, and some are not black holes, but they are a gas of gravitons. They are just like products of gravitons. But there are more states, and the other states should be the ones accounting for the entropy of the black hole. So you call just everything else a black hole. At this level, it's a very quantum. It's n equals 2. It's the first state we found. So if you ask, what's the next black hole state? No one found it yet. No one wrote it down yet. It's a very simple problem. You have this Hamiltonian. You want to find Hamiltonian times state equals 0 and find what states have 0 energy. And this is the only one that was found so far explicitly. But we know there are more. But we did not manage to write it down simply because the matrix has become very big. Sorry, tell again. That? Ah, if you take even n, there are more solutions. Yeah, because here I'm plotting the analytic continuation of these states. If I were to plot which ones are surviving with respect to the norm, many of these lines would go away. So this is useful. I don't care if they go away. I don't care if they have zero, zero norm or negative norm. Because then I get a couple, everything is coupled and it's nice to keep it. But there will be no paradox. The energies will never become complex and so on. All this will be properly regularized once I take into account uh, this norm matrix. That's a good question. We don't know. For example, the next black hole, what will it be? Will it be Konishi entangled with three gravitons? This is like a three cubic state. But for example, we got a small string, this Konishi, with two gravitons around. It could have been just a big string, and the big string could have collapsed by self-gravitation. There was no reason to be a, a three-string state. I did not know. I thought it's going to be a single string, and it will be... <laughs> there are many states here at the end. No, no, but it, at large n, it will have a definite number, a definite number of strings. So when we go higher, for example, Will it be a four string? Uh, will it be the maximal number of strings? Well, now it's obvious because I showed you. But <laughs> if I had showed you it was a single string, <laughs> you would say it's obvious that it's a single string. <laughs> so, uh, do I have a, a few more minutes? So, just to conclude. So, so this is what we saw: was this green line. I start with some state that had some energy, and I decrease n. I'm plotting one over n, and the energy becomes zero. Now, this was all done in the regime where I could do computations in the gauge theory, which was weak coupling. And now you could ask, what happens more generally as I change the coupling and so on? And the proposal is basically that what happens is the following. So if I start at, if I am at n equals to 2 and I change the coupling, nothing happens. The energy is still 0. Why? Because of supersymmetry. The state will be supersymmetric. Nothing will happen. So we go from large n, where we have three strings. They become a black hole, supersymmetric, and they remain a black hole. 
More interesting is if we go to large n and we have Konishi plus two gravitons, what happens when I increase the coupling? And this is fun because you can say at the infinite n, they are decoupled. It's Konishi and two gravitons. Forget about the gravitons and just follow Konishi because it's infinite n. And then what does Konishi become? It becomes a very heavy massive string state because it will be proportional to the tension of the string, so it will be infinite. And this would be this red line that we call integrability because I know how to draw this line with integrability. That is wrong, or more or less wrong. It's wrong in the following sense, that if you go to n equal infinity, yes, it would be true. But if you go to n equal 1 million, it will not be true. Because there is a small, an important difference that when n is infinite, you have lots of level crossing in the spectrum because of integrability. Since you have integrability and since the spin chains don't mix, two strings don't mix with one string and they just cross each other. As soon as you make n not infinite, these levels will repel a little bit. And now, if you start with this, instead of going to infinity, you go to some finite value here. Now, what happens in the real world if we were an experimentalist that could change lambda? It depends how fast you change. If you do it adiabatically, you stay in the lowest curve. If you do it fast, you jump and you go to infinity. So now it will depend how rushed you are. But if you are very, very cautious, then you would go to a four graviton state. And so the claim is that at strong coupling, which is the regime where gravity, you trust gravity, the claim is there. You take four gravitons, presumably very entangled, and then if you were to increase the gravitational constant, they would form a black hole. OK, so let me conclude with some simple messages in blue and a summary of what I said in the middle. So let me start for the summary. So we have this example of a theory of quantum gravity. And in this theory, we did some explorations. We knew that the lightest quantum black hole exists for two colors. It has dimension 19 over 2, and we wrote its wave function. And then we asked, how do we follow this state? And when we follow this state, we saw that if we still remain at weak coupling and go to large n, it's an entangled state of Konishi and two gravitons. It's fun that he, it's, it's, it's important that it's very entangled, and that's what it is. Then, if we also follow that state not only to infinite n, but to strong coupling, then it depends. If we do it slowly, it will become a four graviton state. And it was useful to think of the number of colors as a continuous parameter so that we could smoothly follow all this and argue about what would happen. Otherwise, it would be hard to uh, get a handle on this question. No, it would become just a Konishi state. It, has, it would be the analog of the first massive string state in string theory, which has mass square root of 2 times alpha prime. But alpha prime would be very big, and so it would become very big. And, um, it is just that uh, the string tension would be big, and so the mass is big. By very massive, I mean, it's the lightest string state, but it's very massive because it's proportional to lambda to the one quarter. But the punchline is that uh, non-abelian gauge theories with n colors describe the real world, of course, and are also candidates for theories in quantum gravity. So that's a nice thing to know. It's uh, because non-abelian gauge theories are still easier to study than theories of quantum gravity. So it's great that we can study very well posed quantum field theories and learn about something about quantum gravity. And thinking about black hole wave functions, we can hand wave a lot and uh, use very mystical words and so on. But it's important to realize that at least in some setups, it's something very concrete. And asking what is the wave function of a black hole is asking what are the operators with big dimension in a conformal field theory. And so it's nice that we have this tool that uh, and there is a lot to explore in this direction, and uh, we should. And uh, thank you for your attention. So before we go to question, I want to ask you, uh, do you prefer questions, or do you prefer to go for dinner? <laughs> okay, let, let's have a few questions, at least. <laughs> so, uh, so and Michael had a question. Sorry, I mean, let me make the so-called Rolls Royce uh, question, namely, after you present all this, is there any chance that with this technique, ideas, or whatever, you get clue on, I don't know, the hierarchy masses of standard model or other big question of the, of the world, let's say? No, 
no about, the, about the first type that you said no. <laughs> I mean, but if you put matter, if you put fermions, can you get uh, some picture? No, the type of questions we could imagine asking here is asking, uh, for example, we believe that any large n gauge theory is a string theory, okay. more or less. So then you could ask, are there universal subsectors within any large n gauge theory or matrix model? And are there subsectors there when you take operators very big that exhibit universal behavior that resembles the behavior of black hole physics? And can we explore this behavior and make it closer and closer to GR to discover a dual no, actually, of GR and the real world? I'm not interested in black hole. I'm interested in matter. I'm interested in the spectrum of particles. I'm not interested in black hole. No, this talk was about black holes, right? So no, can, <laughs> you you are asking no, the... can you say something or not? <laughs> we can discuss it either other topics, but the topic of the no, talk was black this holes. Model, <laughs> this model has the pretension to say something or reality or not. Ah, okay. Maybe your question is, is n equals four, which is a theory that is matter in, in n equals four, our matrices and so on. So is there any connection between n equals four and the real world? Yeah. And is n equals four useful for learning about pure glue, for yeah. example? Now, I think practically, probably not, but conceptually, one could, for example, take n equals 4 super young mills and add to it plus Konishi. That would break all supersymmetry. It would lift, the theory would no longer be conformal. It would flow to n equal to pure glue. So if I could study conformal perturbation theory of take n equals 4 plus Konishi, <laughs> that theory would give you the glue ball spectrum. What would be the ingredients in doing this conformal perturbation theory? Would be knowing with infinite precision the spectrum and three-point functions of the starting CFT. How many operators would you need to get reliable global spectrum? Many operators you would need to constitute to be do some big truncation. That's where it becomes a practical problem. So right now we can compute the spectrum of the first hundred operators very well, and we can compute the three-point functions of the first five or six very well. But we will need like the first 100 as well. So it's in progress. I think soon we will know the CFT data of n equals 4 so well that perhaps we could use it as a starting point to break supersymmetry and flow to something more realistic. Like, for example, flowing to just pure glue and getting the mass of glue balls. That would be a long term direction. I think that's plausible. Then you can put the clock that will flow to Cassidy. Yeah, <laughs> the first one is already <laughs> good for. Uh... Okay, this uh, relates to your blue rectangle, uh -huh. um, the the lower one. Okay. Now there is a small literature with which I'm not enormously familiar, where people dream that certain operators related to black holes might be related to the Riemann zeta function. Now, I'm unconvinced okay. by that literature because the best they can do uh, so far is to get the mean density of states, density of the Riemann zeros, and not the all-important fluctuations. However, what is exciting in what I see there is the connection with dilatation because there's, a, there's strong non-trivial arguments from Alan Kahn and us and others that uh, dilation is central to understanding the Riemann zeta function and the Riemann hypothesis. So mm. there might be a case for reawakening that possible connection with black holes. And my question to you is, have you thought in that direction? Are you aware of this? I'm not aware of at all about uh, this connection to the zeta function. But one of the key features that people always study in the connection with black holes is chaotic properties of black holes in the same mm -hmm. way that the zeta function, if you plot it, you don't know what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And you could try to ask, as I follow these operators and try to measure information properties of the states, do I see that black holes are more chaotic than strings, for example, and so on? And you could try, as you follow these lines here, to measure deviations from, say, a generalized random matrix ensemble predictions and see how chaotic and so on. And that we have done, yeah, a little bit. We have started, but I'm not a specialist, so, so I probably is, did so, not plot so the main things. Refining the question then, is there any hint or even, perhaps even knowledge that the eigenvalues of these operators that you're considering would have uh, properties, for example, analogous to random matrix? Uh, yeah, this, there is evidence that this is true. Yeah. Yeah. 
So mm. that is yeah. So that that's evidence. Yeah, the states that we follow here, they also mm. obey this the, this uh, random matrix prediction. Uh, if you compute this uh, information entropy of the state, it uh, it gives uh, what it should. Thank you. Other questions? So, Giuseppe, do you want to comment? No. Where does the ADS come in your... Uh, in <clears throat> so your it just theory? turns out that the fact that this, you see, whenever you draw these spin chains, this it looks already like a string, right? Yeah. But then if you ask, where is the string moving? What's the background where it's moving? Is it flat space? And it's not exactly flat space. It's a, a background that is like a gravitational box that's called ADS. And one nice thing about ADS is that ADS is a space that geometrizes this dilatation symmetry. In the same way that the theory is invariant under scale, you want like a box that is invariant under changes of scale. And there is a, a funny geometry that is like multiple copies of flat space, but with some direction that changes as you change the scale, that geometrizes dilatations and that makes this duality possible. Yeah, so these strings live in five dimensions, for example, yeah. So more questions? Oh, can you couple some uh, light operators and study? I mean, if you want to study black hole, you probably want to couple some particles too. Great, yeah. So th th that's true. We could, for example, now we have these states that we that would look like black holes. And now we could consider black hole, black hole conjugate, and some light operators. And this would be like probes moving in the background of the black hole. And we could ask, do they behave as expected, and so on. Uh, the problem is that we have mostly access at weak coupling, and we would expect these universal behaviors that you refer to at strong coupling. And I believe the lines that I drew here, but this line here is speculation. This line, I guess, the, all the other lines, I would know how to compute rigorously. This line is a guess. It must go from here to here. I drew something random. So what you are asking is about the behavior of heavy, heavy, light, light along this line. And that would be very interesting. And to address this question, I would need to understand better how do I make sense of n equals 4 at non-integer n non-perturbatively. Because here, what, what we did was what people do in statistical mechanics when they relate POTS model to percolation or ON to self-avoiding walks is you translate the model to graphical things. And then when you have loops, you say this is a loop, it's a weight, and it's a very perturbative description. And so in perturbation theory, loops of color become n, n can become whatever you want. How do I do it in string theory at strong coupling? I need some, we need some new idea. Right, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Pedro again.